Good noontide, Howard Wig, Code Green, Think Tech Hawaii. Welcome, one and all. Anybody who's been in the environmental movement for the last several decades, it seems like, maybe not that long, knows Jeff Mekalina. He was very active in the Sierra Club, and then he, with Hank Rogers, founded Blue Planet which remains to this day a very, very powerful environmental activist organization. Then he retired. I think it was at the ripe old age of 36 or something like that. And now he's coming back into the environmental scene. And the operative word in today's presentation by Jeff is disruption. Anybody who knows the situation we're in today would say that for all the horrific problems we have on planet Earth, Israel, Ukraine, Iran, from the arc of history, they are just little monkeys puttering around, whereas the big 800-pound gorilla is climate change. And those of us who really study the matter know that all the efforts we're making today are just nibbling around the edges. If we're going to really hit climate change, bop it in the nose, we need somebody to face that 800-pound gorilla and get disruption going. So welcome, Jeff Michalina. Tell us about disruption and climate change. Well, thanks, Howard. First of all, you're super charitable and generous, and I appreciate the introduction, but Anyone who's also been in this space knows that Howard has Howard has been there since the beginning, uh, leading the charge at the state energy office for codes and all things, um, all things good and, and green. And um, you were a climate change advocate before we even knew what that was. So thank you for all of your service, Howard. Um, so yeah, you know, excited to explore this idea of, of disruption, um, and it's. It's one of those things where you know change happens slowly, and then it happens all at once. To paraphrase uh, Hemingway, I think. Um, but the, the example that I want to share is what what happened last August eighth, uh, twenty twenty three. Um, just a horrific tragedy on, on Maui uh, with the with the climate fire that came through Lahaina um, and devastated this historic community. You know, took over a hundred lives, um, and just. It's. I'm afraid that's a portent for the future of what we're going to see in this, you know, climate uh, amplified future of of disruption uh, when it comes to higher temperatures, you know, stronger storm events, and then these freak things that we think of as like black swan events all of a sudden start happening um, with much greater frequency. I think the. The positive thing to remind ourselves of is that same day on August 8th, on a different island, over on the island of Kauai, um, the island was largely powered by renewable energy. Most of the energy that day came from 100% renewable. Uh, some days on Kauai, they're powered by 100% renewable for a few hours of the day. Um, with all the solar that they have, uh, they have a lot of storage, battery storage. They also have some biomass and hydroelectric over there. Uh, they don't have any wind power because of um, the, the threat to the birds, um, but they have made investments over the last decade that's enabled them to reach very high penetrations of renewables, averaging nearly 70% renewable energy throughout the year. So when I think of August 8th, you think of that, that tragedy and what could happen, what we could see with climate change, but we should also think of August 8th of one of those days of Hawaii being a model for what a sustainable energy future could look like um, if we make the right decisions and go by design instead of by default. Um, so some lessons that we're learning from Hawaii that we think are uh, exportable to the globe as we confront this challenge uh, collectively. And, and Hawaii can really play that role of being, you know, not only inspiration for the globe, but also provide a model in a lot of ways as we learn lessons on this journey. Uh, in two, 2015, Hawaii was the first state in the nation to adopt a 100% renewable energy law. Um, 
you know, at the time, some folks said that this was going to be impossible or impossibly expensive. Uh, and we soon found that it was the cheapest path, and it will be the cheapest path for us to take. Um, and again, Kauai provides a really good example of that. With high renewable energy penetration, they're currently paying the lowest residential electricity rates in the state. They also have the highest reliability in the past few years, um, fewest number of blackouts. Um, and it, it's just such a great example of what's possible if we stay on this path to, to clean energy. So when Hawaii passed that law in 2015, California followed suit three years later, uh, picking 100% renewable energy in the exact same year, 2045, as Hawaii. Um, so it just really shows that we, we might have a disproportionate you know, influence on how others kind of you know, pursue this path to, to clean energy. Since then, about 13 or 14 other states have adopted similar laws, and many states have adopted, you know, um, executive kind of um, you know, targets and goals that aren't, aren't statutes yet, but they're on, on the path to get there. Recently, in the past week, Cayman Islands adopted a 100% by 2045 goal. Many other island nations are following uh, suit as well. So we can, you know, again, have a, um, a disproportionate sort of influence on how others respond to this. And I think we should, because Hawaii is that unique, special place in the world. Uh, no other you know, place has this exact mix, this geographic isolation with this size, uh, the resource mix, um, and the history of innovation, uh, dating way back from the very first people in Hawaii, um, using technology and innovation to survive on these islands uh, and to do it sustainably. So. Now, that's my uh, preface. Uh, I think uh, there's a lot to explore here, Howard, but uh, curious what, what you think. Okay, thank you very much. That's uh, Kauai Activism 101. Yes, we all look at uh, the island of Kauai, and we're very, very proud. And when I go to conferences on the mainland, they, they point to us. They say, you guys continue to lead. We're watching you. We had a delegation from Japan come in recently, and they, in essence, said, we have come to learn from you in Hawaii. So we can be proud of that. Certainly. Right. Um, but we can't, we can't rest on our laurels. And we also, you know, we learn both good and bad. I mean, we, we have some missteps. Um, we're still among the highest in the world per capita for greenhouse gas emissions. Um, we have, a, we have our work cut out for us if we hope to reach our, you know, our 2030 carbon goal and then our 2045 decarbonization goal. Um, it's a pretty, pretty steep curve ahead, and this is where it's going to require, you know, I think other forms of hopefully technology disruption um, and really coming together to understand and you know, have a shared understanding of just the magnitude of this problem um, and how we can, you know, move into this future of abundance. Um, if we make the right decisions and, you know, again, I keep saying go by design instead of default because these changes are coming and it can be on our terms or, or it can be on someone else's terms or on nature's terms. Uh, and she might not have the, the same, same ideas that we do for uh, what a, you know, resilient future looks like. So um, we have to make some tough choices today and particularly on the, the transportation um, side of things. We haven't made much progress there and decarbonize, decarbonizing our transportation sector, you know, thinking mostly, you know, aviation, ground transportation, and then to a small extent, our uh, marine uh, transportation. Uh, the easy ones really are ground transportation. Um, and, you know, I say easy, it, it, not that it's trivial, but it's certainly easier to decarbonize our vehicles than it is our airplanes right now. Um, we have options. They're currently on our roads. We have you know, over 31,000 electric vehicles uh, in the state. Um, unfortunately, that's only 3% of our overall passenger vehicles. So we're still burning a lot of gasoline, uh, over 400 million gallons of gasoline every year. We average, you know, about a, a gallon a person um, every day in Hawaii. And, you know, some folks might think, well, I don't drive at all. And that means someone else is burning two gallons. So it's... Uh, we, we love our cars. Um, you know, there are certain trucks that have become, you know, the most popular vehicle for, for the past couple decades. 
Uh, so we're going to have to have a, some new tools to really solve that challenge if we hope to uh, rapidly decarbonize. But again, moving to electric vehicles, um, it's not like it was 120 years ago where we went from horses you know, and horse-drawn carriage to automobiles. That was a radical shift. You know, going from a gasoline-powered car to an electric car um, isn't too much of a isn't too much of a lift. But we do need to get ahead of that with the charging infrastructure, um, making sure it's accessible to everyone, um, and really providing the right incentives so we can move quickly and stop um, stop selling gasoline vehicles because we just can't afford to have them on our roads uh, if we want to decarbonize. Um, I think the other challenge, too, is, you know, again, thinking about um, aviation and Hawaii has a real great, we're well positioned to address that, that challenge. Um, you know, we, we really rely on, on, on flights to get to Hawaii, moving, you know, us and tourists and our goods. Um, so we should be an innovator for sustainable aviation fuel and then alternative, um, you know, alternative ways of, of traveling, maybe different you know, aircraft different fuel sources, or maybe things we haven't even really thought seriously about. Well, I would point out that the first commercial airline to go exclusively powered with biofuel is a certain local airline that flies from Honolulu to Wahana, and they may have uh, branched out from there. Another first for Hawaii. That's great. Yeah, I did hear about the electric uh, aircraft, I think it was Ampere, where they did the the first flight on a commercial uh, route. Um, so certainly, you know, inter-island aviation could be electrified. Uh, again, not not trivial, but but easier to do here um, with our short hops between islands uh, than some of those longer haul flights. And I, I know that there's lots and lots of research going on in improving the lithium ion and other batteries get more power packed into less space and certainly less weight. When right. we achieve that, boom, we, we can uh, talk seriously about uh, at least uh, short hop aviation. Right, because that's the challenge, right? You need, you need more power, you need bigger batteries, then you're adding more weight, and then you have to have even bigger batteries. Uh, but the, again, a lot of interest and in research going into new battery chemistries um, entirely, you know, new approaches that a few years ago were kind of off the table, but now it's, hey, what can we do with, you know, solid state and zinc air and, you know, new, new chemistries that um, uh, might, might seem kind of really out of left field, but uh, we could be seeing them in airplanes and cars and computers and phones in the near future. And just looking at uh cars, we, the price of solar batteries or plain old batteries is coming down and that has good implications for EVs. The lighter the batteries, the longer the life, the more cost effective uh, electric vehicles are. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, and we, we do need to think of electric vehicles as, you know, we can make those as efficient as possible. Uh, you know, we, when we think of the, the tailpipe standards and the, the efficiency standards for vehicles, we think about, you know, making a more efficient, you know, gasoline car or a hybrid or, but not just getting into electric vehicles, great, but we can actually go further because there's a, a wide range of efficiency among, you know, electric vehicle models. Um, I drive an electric vehicle, it gets about four and a half miles to a kilowatt hour, which actually just blows my mind because you think of a, old-fashioned light bulb, you know, and the fact that 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 thing or 10 of those bulbs could can move me almost five miles uh, is pretty impressive. Yeah. But some of the vehicles yeah. get up to uh, eight miles per kilowatt hour. Um, so, you know, if we can think of all the ways uh, and, you know, old Amory Lovins at Rocky Mountain Institute would always talk about, you know, the, the hyper car and using you know, carbon fiber and other uh, materials to really work on aerodynamics. And, um, you know, we can make really efficient vehicles and that will have huge implications for, you know, our transition if we need a less electricity to power, you know, transportation. You know, one reason that I discovered that uh, China in some ways just leaped 
They didn't leapfrog over us, but they came from a very, very low standard of living and just shot right up. And one reason I was fortunate enough to be in the Shanghai region a few years ago, and one thing I saw was not one thing, thousands of things I saw were electric scooters. Yeah. There's no such thing as a fossil fuel powered scooter. They're all electric. And given the fact that they there are hundreds of thousands of them, what in the world would the air quality be if they all were burning uh, some form of uh, gasoline? So here they are silently scooting all over the place, and there are little scooter parking lots all over the place, and they are jam-packed with scooters. And just compare that to the fact that we average American myself included, are driving even light cars, 2,000 pounds worth of a car just to transport myself and my, my groceries from point A to point B. Compare that to the electric scooters that uh, China has. Again, one way that they're just really, really rapidly ascending economically and environmentally. Yeah. I'm sure a lot of that's driven by necessity uh, as well over there. We're, we're seeing a big uptick in you know, that, that micro mobility here in Honolulu and throughout Hawaii, you know, you've seen the folks on scooters. Sometimes, you know, it kind of blows your mind how fast these little things go and uh, then electric bikes as well. Uh, and what a great, you know, oppor opportunity or an option, particularly if that's displacing a vehicle, uh, because, you know, not only environmentally, but economically, we spend so much in, in providing for single occupant you know, gasoline cars, a lot of parking, the insurance, the, you know, the road space, uh, then of course the health and the, the safety aspects as well. Mm -hmm. um, I would rather get whacked by a scooter than a, you know, three ton pickup truck. Um, but you're right. And so much of this is, comes down to our, our habits and sort of normalization around. I mean, you're expected, or it's sort of, it's not unnormal, abnormal to have a a car. I mean, you're, you're kind of expected to have a car in some way. Um, so I think we can have new norms around, you know, acceptable behavior and, and, and how we get around. We have the perfect weather, perfect uh, topography for, um, you know, bikes and uh, these electric scooters and micromobility. And so many trips are, are short, at least in, you know, in the Honolulu urban core. Um, we can make, make that transition. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm thinking of, say, the university campus or high school campuses, community college campuses. Compare the square footage needed to park a scooter or one of those little electric scooters that you're uh, talking about. The parking space needed, it's yeah. just <laughs> totally minuscule. You might get at least 10, if not 15, of those little two-handled scooters. In, into the same space. Yeah, exactly. And and those really sip electricity compared with, like you say, how much gasoline you need to move the entire vehicle that doesn't really serve you. It just, you know, takes up a lot of space and weight. Yeah. And those, uh, I'm thinking of kids now, university kids, high school kids, they're saving so much money or they're saving their parents so much money. Yeah, right. right. Yeah. yeah. Cost so a lot uh, in a car. Yeah, uh, a lot of opportunity, again, in, in the transportation space to, to make that change. And I think what, one thing that comes up uh, fairly often that I hear from folks is, well, you know, first of all, is it, is it better to have an electric car if we're still plugging them into our largely oil-fired, you know, power grid, um, which is the case here in Oahu, you know, most of the energy coming from oil-fired uh, generators. Uh, and the answer is it is. It's still a better choice because the vehicles are so much more efficient when you, you know, they don't idle at, at stops. They have regenerative braking. Um, you, you go much further on an electron than, you know, an internal combustion engine burning gasoline. So, yeah, they're definitely a better choice um, from a carbon standpoint, for sure. Uh, the second, you know, question that comes up is, well, isn't this going to make achieving our 100 percent uh, you know, renewable electricity goal more difficult as we convert nearly a million or actually over a million, you know, gas cars to electric. Um, 
And, and that's an interesting question because it, it's it's sort of yes and. Uh, it, it will be, it will require more energy to power these vehicles, certainly. Um, it may be less than we think because they're so much more efficient. And if we continue to achieve our energy efficiency goals, you know, we can, that, that saved energy can be, can go towards displacing gasoline. So, you know, you think of maybe a big hotel in Waikiki, you know, if they can cut their energy use by 30% with new air conditioning, uh, new lights, um, you know, uh, other ways to just, you know, shave their, their electricity bill, new technologies, that 30% of energy can then be directed towards charging in their parking lot. They don't need to make any upgrades to their transformer or their circuits to accommodate it. They can use the existing capacity they have and, again, displace gasoline instead of just wasting that energy, uh, usually in the form of heat, right? Um, so, you, you know, that, that's a, a real positive if we, again, go by design and not default and, and put the steps in place so we can achieve that. And then what I'm really excited about is using electric vehicles as a uh, really um, something that can help our grid, you know, achieve higher penetration of renewable. I mean, you have batteries. Um, the batteries in vehicles are usually a lot bigger than the, the batteries you typically have in a, in a residential, you know, setting. Um, so you have a lot of storage capacity there. But then also the charging can be used to help sort of regulate the grid. You know, you can turn chargers on and off depending on what's happening on the grid. Um, you know, the driver might just specify, make sure I have at least 100 miles at any given time, but, but use my battery as you'd like to help, you know, provide these ancillary services to the um, energy grid. So a, a lot of positives, um, they can turn into an asset instead of a liability on our overall energy grid. Um, so again, this requires us to really be thinking ahead and, and making the decisions today so we have that future tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that you mentioned the grid. We, like any other grid, we have low points of use and high points of use. And just taking the EV as, as an example, say a family all got home by five in the afternoon and they parked their EV and they're not going anywhere. They sign an, an agreement with Hawaiian Electric saying, yes, as you said, you can use the power in my battery up to a certain extent to feed the grid. So you can feed the grid at exactly the time that it needs the electricity. And therefore, all those little what are called peaking plants that Hawaiian Electric has to use right now to meet that peak demand, a lot of them don't need to be fired up because the EV batteries and all those other storage batteries are uh, are hard at work. And uh, just speaking of which, we have so much PV, photovoltaic, in Hawaii now, including Oahu, that in the middle of a sunny day, we are producing more electricity than we're using. So we have storage, 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 these big refrigerator-sized uh, batteries. And we store all that nice solar energy up in the middle of the day and then feed it into the grid during those peak hours. So it's working out really well. And during COVID, we had all these uh, supply chain uh, issues. We couldn't get stuff here. But now that's broken loose. and We can get almost as much as we need. So hopefully we will be adding, adding, adding to storage and, and PV. Just, just at a mile a minute. Whenever I go on Nimitz Highway in the airport region and look at warehouses, 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 just tens and tens and tens of thousands of square feet of nice, almost flat roof. Why in the world isn't every square inch of that co covered with PVs with their, their batteries under there? Yeah. Yeah, that's a great point. Every rooftop needs to be its own power plant, um, and we have to make sure we have those policies in place and incentives to get there. The, the other thing where, you know, there's always going to be friction as we make this transition, and, and solar is such a great resource, but it does take, you know, if not rooftop space, it's going to take, you know, land, and that land sometimes competes with other uses, particularly looking at the good, flat, sunny land. Um, and particularly on a place like Oahu, where it's really in short supply and our energy use is high. 
Well, what I'm really excited about is the prospect of pairing farming with solar farms. Mm. Uh, and there's some great work being done right now at, at testing different uh, crops and seeing what will grow well between the ro rows of solar panels, mm. you know, changing the, the, the width of them, the height to see, you know, what they can grow. And some of this is happening uh, with Nilani Solar, uh, Clearway uh, Energy, and there's another firm involved too. Um, that's just really great work there. And I could see a future where we do both. We solve both our, you know, our food and our ag challenge and our energy challenge at once. And mm -hmm. by pairing them, we might be able to do both where, you know, before uh, neither might have penciled out. Mm -hmm. um, so really excited about that prospect. But, but as you said, first things first, every rooftop, a power plant. Yeah, especially... Well, I, I'm so glad that every mom and pop, every homeowner is at least looking at the possibility of PVs because there's all these incentives, financial incentives to, to get up there. Yeah. And what you're referring to is egg, egg what do we call it? Egg, agri egg, not agro, agro. <laughs> They're not angry Voltaics. <laughs> and a lot of, you know, we're very, very sunny in Hawaii. A lot of plants, don't need all of that sunlight. They, they the broad brief, broad leafed vegetables. That's too much. So semi shade them with these uh, so, solar panels. Yeah, and Jeez. that is one way that farmers can uh, get some added income. Just enter yeah. into agreement with with the solar companies there. Yeah, a lot of opportunity. And uh, that those are very much locally grown, hopefully organic. Boom, the price of those vegetables goes way up for the farmer, for the retailer, and it's much healthier for uh, us, the consumers. Yeah, so much opportunity and, and so much that we can pilot and demonstrate here to really show the globe what this transition looks like. And it can be one of abundance, uh, not sacrifice. So mm -hmm. uh, hopeful that we can make these smart choices and get us on the right track. You know, you mentioned uh, rooftops, and I just, I'd just i be remiss not to mention our green bank uh, over, that, over in your shop over there that's doing great work, mm -hmm. helping particularly low-income folks access uh, low-interest loans for solar. It's been a, a wild success. And again, something that Hawaii has innovated, and now we're seeing it really take root at a national level as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, speaking of which, there's all of that. President Biden federal money out there, and we're applying for it. And we just got word today, I believe we got uh, $63 million to promote wow. uh, renewable and, and solar financing. Exciting. Yeah. And That's we're great. hard at work harvesting more, more of those dollars. So, that, on that cheery note, we need to uh, wrap things up. Jeff Michalina, so good to see you again. And let's have you on again in the pretty foreseeable future, because I know you're going to be doing great things. We didn't even talk about your your own personal professional uh, evolution here. Right. But Thanks, Howard. Well, yeah, so much pleasure, Jeff. This is Think Tech Hawaii, Howard Wig, Code Green. See you next time. We want to announce that ThinkTech Hawaii is moving into a new phase and will not be producing regular talk shows after April 30th. We will retain our website and YouTube channel and will accept new content on an ad hoc basis. We are also developing a legacy archive program to provide continuing public access to our content. If you can help us cover the costs of the transition and the development of our legacy archive program, please make a donation on thinktechaway.com. Thanks so much. Aloha.